This is Talking Foreign Policy, a critical look at Canada's role abroad. I'm Eve Engler, and today we're talking about yesterday's uh, Canada voting at the uh, United Nations um, uh, uh, reversing its international isolation at the United Nations. Uh, Canada voted with about 150 other countries in support of a resolution uh, supporting a ceasefire in Gaza. And this resolution um, reverses courses in two ways. One, that the Trudeau government had previously refused uh, the protest demand to call for a ceasefire. And also it reverses course because um, there are, Canada has been, even a couple, as of a couple of days ago, was isolating itself um, against the vast majority of the world in opposing resolutions upholding uh, Palestinian rights. So to discuss this uh, somewhat important UN vote, um, uh, Dimitri Lascaris is a longtime Palestine solidarity activist, a former um, um, candidate for a, the uh, leadership of the Green Party. Um, and so Dimitri, uh, first of all, thanks for coming on. And secondly, why do you think the uh, Trudeau government um, uh, voted the way they did yesterday? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me, Eve. Um, I it, it's, I think it's useful to recall uh, a similar circumstance that arose in another very important issue of foreign policy about 20 years ago, and that was the decision of the Chrétien uh, government not to involve Canada and the coalition of Willing and George Bush's, Tony Blair's criminal war of aggression on Iraq. Um, when I critique Canada as being essentially a vassal of the United States government on the international stage, I'm often given this example of how Canada broke ranks with the United States on a very important issue of foreign policy. Uh, but first of all, people forget that Canada did that only because, I well, in the context in which the French and the German governments uh, decidedly rejected the so-called intelligence that underlay the decision to invade Iraq. Uh, and so Canada had very important political cover from other Western states. Uh, and, and, and as you've documented quite, uh, I think, persuasively, after the fact and covertly, Canada actually did play a role behind the scenes in the criminal invasion of Iraq and today has troops in Iraq, uh, even though the, by all accounts, a majority of the Iraqi people don't want Western troops in their country. Uh, but uh, th what happened here is something similar. Uh, it, there was a there was a, 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 a press release issued by the Trudeau government uh, within the 24 to 48 hours before the decision was made, or at least announced, that they were going to vote in favor of the ceasefire resolution, where Trudeau met with the government, I believe it was the governments of New Zealand and Australia, and, uh, and, and announced that they jointly together were going to vote for the ceasefire. And in addition, although they weren't part of this discussion, there probably were discussions going on behind the scenes with other major European countries, including France and Belgium, who voted in favor of the ceasefire. So Canada had a lot of political cover, first of all. Uh, Japan also voted in favor of the ceasefire, another major ally, uh, 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 you know, although it's in Asia from the Western country, a G7 country. The uh, Canada, I can't imagine that Canada would have done this if there weren't a lot of other Western European countries who just got to a point where they didn't feel that they could credibly uh, avoid uh, supporting a ceasefire uh, with all the carnage that's taking place in Gaza. So I think that that is definitely a factor. Uh, they had political cover from other Western governments. I think it's also uh, certainly, uh, from my perspective, undoubtedly a factor, although to what extent we'll never really know, that there was intense public pressure uh, all around this country on the Trudeau government to do something. Uh, and let's be clear, this is the absolute bare minimum of human decency, what it's done here. In a context uh, where uh, you know the General Assembly doesn't have the ability to compel Israel to act, everybody knows that Israel is going to, at least for some period of time, float this resolution. That's exactly what it's done since it was passed last 24 hours. It's continued the carnage, continued to commit war crimes, so it's not a big deal, frankly, for Canada uh, to join with other states and uh, especially other Western states and simply call for a ceasefire. Um, but it took a lot of public pressure to get the government to that point. 
there was there was talk of people in the Arab and Muslim community abandoning the liberals, and the liberals are you know in a really bad state in terms of their popularity at the moment. Uh, it's looking very grim for them in terms of their electoral prospects. Uh, so there are a lot of votes out there, and it's not just, of course, the Arab and Muslim community. There are a lot of Canadians of conscience who are appalled by the fact that the Trudeau government couldn't bring itself even to call for a ceasefire. So I think to some extent it was, uh, you know, we don't want to be seen to uh, be standing against the consensus in the West, because now the United States stands alone, really, with a, a Czechia, you know, voted along with the United States and Austria. But that's it, you know, and Micronesia and Nauru. <laughs> The countries that voted collectively have a population, uh, most of which is the U.S. population, that's less than 5% of the global population, the ones that voted with Israel. Uh, so, you know, it was just getting to the point where Canada was looking too much of a pariah, uh, and the, the combination of public pressure and, you know, political cover from other Western states, I think, tipped the balance in favor of Canada supporting this resolution. Yeah, there were definitely mass, mass protests that, on a kind of unprecedented level that um, that influenced it. Now, the reaction from uh, the uh, apartheid lobby or the genocide lobby, uh, some of it was just uh, kind of comical to see uh, uh, this, the head of the uh, Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, I believe, referred to it as disgusting. Um, and there was all kinds of so, over-the-top uh, rhetoric. What do you make of that uh, that kind of panic from the uh, from the uh, the voices, the the anti-Palestinian voices? Yeah, I mean, I saw words like you mentioned, disgusting, horrified, yeah. shocked. All these are words that were used by either Sija or people who sit on the board of Sija or senior executives of Sija. Appalled was another word they used. Uh, cowardice. I mean, it was just unbelievable, Eve. You know, they just went bonkers. They went absolutely bonkers. Not just Sija, B'nai B'rith went berserk. Uh, you know, uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center went berserk. Uh, the usual suspects in the Canadian media, like Andrew Coyne and, uh, you know, Robin Urbach went haywire. And all Canada did was vote in favor of a non-binding resolution that was supported by 95% of humanity calling for a ceasefire. That's it. That's all it did. It hasn't followed this up with any meaningful action, for example, an arms embargo, sanctions of any other kind on the state of Israel, calling for the ICC to investigate war crimes. In fact, Canada opposed the International Court of Justice investigating potential war crimes by Israel in a letter it sent to the, uh, the, the ICJ in August of this year. All it did was the absolute bare minimum, and they went crazy. And to me, what this says is that it's not just Israel, which has become extraordinarily extreme and violent and racist. It is the lobby in Canada and in other major Western states. These people are now uh, in, in, in the realm of what could only be fairly described as fascism. They are, fa they are outright fascists. They're still treated as respectable commentators on international affairs by the mainstream media. But for them to react in this manner after... 20,000 people have been slaughtered in Gaza, 9,000 plus children at a minimum, you know, over 70 journalists, hundreds of medical personnel, hundreds of United Nations employees. For them to react this way because of what the Trudeau government did means these people are extreme genocidal racists. I don't care how many degrees they have. I don't care how esteemed they are in the community how much money they've made, how influential they are in the mainstream discourse. If you react that way to what the Trudeau government did, you're a supporter of Israel, you are a genocidal racist, period. Yeah, and so I certainly agree with that. It's pretty, it is pretty mark remarkable to uh, to watch this play out and, and this types of reactions. But so like, you know, this is really an absolute bare minimum. Right. And it doesn't compel Israel to do anything. Uh, the, the Security Council resolution that the U.S. Um, vetoed uh, does have uh, uh, the legal weight of the of international law. Uh, Israel can still, of course, uh, uh, flout that. Um, uh, but it but it's it's symbolically important. I think it, it does also put pressure on the U.S. And part of what this this resolution is doing is building that diplomatic pressure, not directly on Israel, but on the patron uh, that's providing the diplomatic cover for all the crimes Israel's committing, 
Washington and and it increases the pressure and there's talk about another resolution to be brought uh, to the Security Council to make it you know force Washington's hand uh, one more time. Um, so some of that going on, but from a, from a Canadian uh, perspective, this is really a first step, minimum step. Let's get into a little bit of some of the other uh, steps. You mentioned arms embargo, um, uh, but yeah, just lay out a few. I mean, you, I've, I've, I'm of the opinion that if Canada had just treated Israel as a, a regular um, right wing ally, let's say, as they treated Colombia uh, before the, the current government, you know, trade agreement, uh, different types of aid and diplomatic relations, whatnot, uh, weapon sales. They're just treating Israel like a normal uh, right-wing ally. The, the Palestine Solidarity Movement would have would have made a big victory because uh, we, in fact, treat Israel as a real special kind of case. But yeah, just go through a little bit of what, um, you know, if, if they're really serious about, about, um, about uh, uh, having Israel uh, you know, stop the slaughter in Gaza, some of the things they could do quite, quite easily. Okay, so they they under the Canada Free Trade uh, uh, Israel Free Trade Agreement, they confer trade benefits on the settlements on products made in the settlements. They do this despite the fact that there's no provision in the Canada Israel Free Trade Agreement which requires them to do that, and uh, they um, they themselves recognize that the settlements are a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. So they could just announce they don't need to go to go any jurisdiction. They have to provide any, you know, adopt any legislation. The government could just announce that we're not going to, you know, uh, provide a, a preferential tariff treatment on products uh, produced in Israel's uh, West Bank settlements. Uh, they could say, uh, right now they're doing the opposite. They could say, we aren't going to allow product of Israel labels to appear on any of those products. You're going to have to say that they come from uh, the West, uh, the occupied West Bank, from an Israeli settlement in occupied territory. They could do that without legislation. Uh, they could impose an arms embargo. Let's look at all the, uh, the 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 sanctions they've imposed on Russia. And Russia has not conducted the war there. It's certainly uh, engaged in acts of extreme violence, and there have been civilians killed, no doubt about it. Uh, but uh, if you compare the level of civilian casualties, children deaths, the rate at which civilians have been killed in Ukraine to what has happened in Gaza, Gaza is far worse. So why not just impose upon Israel the same sanctions which the Canadian government has imposed upon Russia? Uh, they won't even do the bare minimum, which is an arms embargo. Uh, why not write to the, uh, the, I, the International Court of Justice and say, we rescind that letter that we sent you in August of this year. In fact, we now support the International Court of Justice taking jurisdiction over this case and rendering an advisory opinion on Israeli war crimes, potential Israeli war crimes. Uh, they could start voting in favor of all the resolutions at the UN General Assembly that support Palestine. While this genocide was happening, this is so outrageous, Eve, they voted against a resolution at the United Nations calling upon Israel to withdraw to the 1967 borders. If Israel, Israel doesn't do that, there's no realistic prospect of a Palestinian state. They say constantly that they support the two-state solution. And they vote against a resolution that was supported by the vast majority of states simply calling on Israel to withdraw to the 1967 borders. So why not go to what back to what Canada did decades ago, before Martin, before Harper, when they generally voted in favor of UN General Assembly resolutions that supported the, the fundamental human rights of the Palestinian people? And they could do more than this, right? They're, they're just a simple rhetorical uh uh, a, a change, transformation in the way they address this conflict. They could start talking about the fact that Israel is potentially committing a genocide, that there is a real case to be made against Israel for genocide. They could start using words like war crimes, crimes against humanity. These are things that are completely absent from the government's lexicon. They could recognize, as has Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the UN Human Rights Council, Bet Salem, Yeshdin, and on and on, that Israel is committing the crime of apartheid, instead of denying that that's the case without ever explaining why they disagree with the human rights consensus. There's so many things they could do, Eve. They have done the absolute, I cannot stress this enough, because you know we in the Palestinian solidarity community in this country, we have been conditioned to be grateful for crumbs. I've seen this over and over and over again. Once in a while, the Trudeau government will toss us a crumb and we get all excited and we clap like trained seals and we go, oh, great, look what they've done. 
This is not even close to being sufficient for any citizen of conscience. Now we have to demand much more. This is not adequate. It's insult, and in fact, this this exercise in rank appeasement that the government engaged in uh, after it cast this vote. Trudeau gets on the phone. He calls the war criminal Net Netanyahu, who is almost apologizing for this. Almost apologizing instead of berating the war criminal for the genocide that he's uh, he's masterminding in Gaza. Uh, you know, and then Melanie Jolie came out. And she was saying things like, you know, we demand the return of the hostages and those brutal savages from Hamas and all and, and on and on. And there were other people who trotted who were trotted out from the Trudeau government to appease the lobby. What they should be doing is saying, this is the beginning. Okay, we've had it. We're done. We cannot support this any longer. And if Israel doesn't stop, we are going to escalate. And we're going to move in the direction of taking the steps that we've taken with respect to Russia, for example, Iran, China on this whole Uyghur question. That's what they should be doing. And we in the Palestinian solidarity community should not even begin to be content with what was accomplished yesterday. It's significant. We deserve uh, a little bit of credit for this, I think, collectively as a movement, but it's not remotely enough. Well, that was a, uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dimitri. This is the Canadian, um, this is Talking Foreign Policy, uh, International Perspective on Canada's Role Abroad. And uh, thanks again, uh, Dimitri Liscaris. Thank you.